Good evening. Hello and welcome to the second presentation of the 2021-22 season of Avalanche Canada's webinar series. My name is Brent Strand and I'm going to be your producer for the evening. We have Nancy Geismar is online and will be the moderator and looking out for your questions in the Q&A box. Thanks for joining us tonight. You may have attended webinars last year and we found it was pretty successful, reaching so many more people with our Avalanche safety message. It's so successful that we opted to do this format again this year. That's been one of the silver linings of COVID this year. Our mission is to help educate backcountry users so you can go out and play safe because we want you all to know more, go farther and come home. First, we'd like to acknowledge that our session is being hosted in the territory of four nations, the Sinaiks, Shekwetmek, Tanaha, Silks, and as a national organization, we acknowledge the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit nations whose land we live and recreate on. We're very thankful for our sponsors being loyal in their support for us during the challenging economic times and working with us to reach new backcountry users this winter. This webinar has been sponsored by MEC, now known as Mountain Equipment Company, and MEC has been a longtime sponsor of Avalanche Canada. We're thrilled with their ongoing commitment to avalanche safety. A couple notes for you attendees out there. You folks are all automatically muted as you start. Um, in order to uh, ask a verbal question, we're going to ask you to raise your hand and I'll go there. I'll unmute you. You can raise a verbal question to the presenters. Um, the other options are to click on the Q&A box there and it'll pop up and you can type your questions in the Q&A. We'd really like it if you use the Q&A box more than the chat box. The chat, we're going to have, uh, we're going to populate that with web links and resources in case you uh, need to get some more information through us. So today's presentation, recognize an avalanche terrain and trip preparedness. Do you ever look at terrain and wonder whether you should venture into it? The presentation this evening is going to look at terrain, weather, snowpack factors, and other things to help make you decisions in the backcountry. We look at the resources available on the Avalanche Canada website. We're also going to have Adventure Smart on who will present on trip preparedness. Our first presenter this evening is going to be Colin Garrity. Colin has recently moved out of Revelstoke down to Vancouver Island, and he's going to be heading up our new field team out there. We already miss Colin around the office here in Revelstoke, but we sure are glad that he's out there developing a new avalanche network for us on the island. Through the field work, the forecasting, and the outreach, we hope that's very successful. Our second presenter is Sandra Riches, the Executive Director for BC Adventure Smart. She works closely with BC Search and Rescue, National Search and Rescue Affiliates, and Outdoor Rec supporters to increase awareness about safe outdoor practices, personal preparedness, helping to reduce the number and severity of those search and rescue incidences. So I'm going to pass along to Colin now, and I hope you folks enjoy the presentation. Hey, Brent. Thanks so much for that uh, awesome introduction. Really appreciate that. And I really miss you guys in Revelstoke too. Definitely going to come back to visit real often. So I'm just going to kick off the presentation here. Great. Just sorting out my windows here. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight uh, to talk about um, a few aspects of Avalanche awareness uh, with one key focus, uh, Zobo recognizing avalanche terrain. So there's lots here for folks that are, are new to talking about avalanches and you're, you're certainly not in the wrong place, you're in the right place. And uh, maybe there'll be actually be some helpful little tidbits for those avalanche aficionados out there that are joining us tonight. And just to kind of figure out a little bit about who we're talking to or who I'm speaking with tonight, I'd love if Brent, you could a, um, launch our first poll. And this is all about uh, how you get around in the, in the backcountry in, in, um, in the snow. So you ski or board, snowmobile, snowshoe or hike, or are you an ice climber? Really keen to know who we're chatting with. So feel free to engage with that poll and we'll get a sense of who we're talking to. We'll leave it up for a second. Got some results there. Lots of skiers and boarders, some snowshoers and hikers. Great. I've got some kind of targeted information for that crew. 
And yeah, some snowmobiles are nice eye climbers too. That's actually pretty impressive. Awesome. And so I, I, I want to roll right into a second one just to get kind of gauge as well where folks uh, avalanche education is at. So have you done an avalanche awareness workshop or have you actually gone and taken a, an avalanche Canada training course like the AST1 or AST2 or are you actually at that professional level with the operations level one or two uh, delivered by the Canadian Avalanche Association? And I think everybody is going to get something out of tonight. Cool. Lots of AST1s. Great. Good on you guys. Some AST2s as well, even some pros and some never evers too. That's great. So there's lots of information that's really geared to folks that are very new to this stuff too. So good mix and a little bit leaning toward the entry level side. Awesome. Okay. So I'll jump right into it. I added a couple of slides, so I don't want to waste any time. One sec. There we are. So first of, all, uh, first of all, for those of you who are new to Avalanche Canada, uh, the simple way to describe what we do is that we're the voice of public avalanche safety in Canada. We're a non-government, not-for-profit organization, and you can see here a few of the things that we focus on in our work. Uh, you're probably already aware of their flagship product that we uh, produce. It's the Avalanche Forecast. We also run avalanche awareness uh, programs. We create curriculum for the recreational avalanche courses like the AST that I mentioned. Uh, we're a general point of contact for all kinds of avalanche in information for media or other purposes. And we also support avalanche research at in institutions like Simon Fraser University and others. Um, really the bottom line for us is it's our mission to encourage and educate people to recreate safely in the winter backcountry. That's what we're all about. And I think that's what you're all about as well. So happy to have you with us. Uh, moving on from there, I'm just going to kind of quick image of an avalanche and a definition to kick us off. So an avalanche is when or occurs when a mass of snow releases from a mountainside and tumbles down a slope. I don't think anybody's confused about that. So that's great. We'll get into a little bit more detail on types of avalanches and that kind of thing too. And what kind of slope qualifies as avalanche terrain. This image gives a bit of an idea of the kind of terrain that we can see avalanches form in as well as the potential consequences of even a relatively small avalanche, like what we're looking at here. Next, I'm gonna show a couple of different kinds of avalanches. And I'll just preface by saying there, there are kind of two types that we, we talk about real often. And one of them is that the first one you'll see is a, a slab avalanche. And the next slide you'll see is a loose snow avalanche. And try to pick out the different details and clues that you're seeing in the image for, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate on a few of the things that we're looking at. So coming up here. Here's our slab avalanche. So we don't need to get too caught up in details just yet, but we can contextualize this idea of avalanches occurring with the idea that they can happen in the fall, kind of like now, uh, in the winter or throughout the winter and in spring months and even in the summer in certain locations. And here we have a loose snow avalanche. And it's actually what we call a wet loose avalanche because it's kind of wet, moist snow. And it's a very different character, how that avalanche moves and the kind of uh, terrain it, it encompasses and the kind of destruction, destructive potentials there too. So some of the things that I, I think about here is that, that slab was composed of, of dry snow, what we call dry snow. And the, the loose snow avalanche is wet snow the speed of that dry snow avalanche, that, that slab avalanche is really, really fast and, and quite dangerous or very dangerous, I should say. Uh, and I would say a little bit easier to get caught up in that, that slab avalanche. You can see that the person that was um, triggering it was very nearly brought into the slope. Uh, whereas with the loose snow avalanche, uh, it wasn't, didn't, wasn't as easily going to involve the person triggering it. So there's a bit of an idea of where, where, what the danger is, but it kind of depends on the context because you know, uh, if you were in the, the firing line of that wet snow avalanche, it's certainly not as, uh, not as uh, safe a place to be as if you were triggering it. So there's different types of danger, different kind of mechanics of how they move, uh, but they're both super dangerous and it's things that we need to be aware of. And you get a bit of an idea of the, the kind of the weather conditions telling the story too, where that there's the kind of midwinter scene with the dry snow and a, versus like a hot spring day with the t-shirt on that wet snow avalanche. Little clues about what's going on. 
So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of ingredients of an avalanche. So although terrain recognition is the primary focus tonight, it's, it is part of a bigger, bigger picture. And in the context of avalanches, terrain really gains significance only when snow and triggers are included in that picture. So when all three combine, we have the potential for avalanches. Now, if people are involved, either as a trigger or they're exposed to an avalanches, the consequences can be deadly. And of course, that's why we're here, right? So it's not such a, a problem if the avalanche is occurring out, you know, a tree falling in the woods with nobody around. But if it's, if it's happening and there's people around, you know, that's why we're here. We need to learn how to manage this, this hazard that's out there in the mountains. So we'll start with the snow uh, part of the, the puzzle and uh, the idea that, first of all, uh, there's a, th a threshold amount of snow is that uh, is required before an avalanche can form. So a certain amount of snow needs to exist on the ground before avalanches can start to happen. And the amount depends on a few factors. Uh, and one of the most important of these is uh, the idea of ground roughness. So if there's roughness in the ground, kind of a, a friction component to the ground, the depth of the snow needs to at least exceed that, that or kind of overcome the depth of that ground roughness to some degree, and as well create a smooth surface uh, on the ground for avalanches to form in the future. So here's one idea of how snow on the ground can look. And we can see it's, it's kind of stated right here. This ground's too rough. There's too much surface roughness here. Uh, there's insufficient snow to form an avalanche that could impact humans in most of the image. Although there's snow, there's just too much ground roughness for avalanches to form in most of the places. But if you have a look in the distance, you'll see there is kind of up in the alpine in the distance there, there is potential for avalanches at higher elevations in the photo. So, you know, the conditions definitely vary with elevation in this image. And then moving into a different kind of environment, we can see that this slope just likely meets the criteria, the slope that the person's looking across the, the, the lake at. So some ground roughness is still visible, but there is still there's a relatively smooth, continuous snow cover, and it's generally kind of exceeded the depth of that ground roughness. Um, so you can see that certainly with the next snowfall piling on that smooth surface, it's definitely going to be game on for avalanches. So if ground, uh, one idea to think about as well is that if ground roughness is absent, so like on a grass slope or something like that, only about 20 or 30 centimeters might be needed for avalanches to form, not very much snow at all. So having an idea of that ground cover below the snowpack is a good thing, which is kind of a link to terrain, which is kind of the, the focus tonight. So I won't get into too much detail, but the structure of the snowpack is another part of the snow piece. Uh, we'll kind of leave that aside for tonight, other than introducing the idea that the snowpack structure can either be stable, which is a good thing, it's a strong snowpack, or it can be unstable, a, which is a bad thing, it's a weak snowpack. So that's, a, that's part of the snow piece of the puzzle. Next, we're into terrain. So this is a key piece. Uh, it's all, it's, and tonight, it's all about learning how to recognize avalanche terrain. And I'm gonna put forward tonight that the most important terrain attribute or characteristic to understand is slope angle or incline. So slope angle can be pretty hard to recognize without training and some experience. So think of the things that we can use. Um, in general, you know, you can think of um, the idea of a black, a black or a double black ski run is kind of just getting into that that really key slope angle for avalanches like a blue run on a ski ski hill a little bit less likely but they're you know steeper parts of that blue run or in certain really touchy avalanche conditions could be uh, a factor whereas like a green slope on the ski hill it's it's probably not capable of producing avalanches even though you may still be adjacent or kind of in avalanche terrain at the same time now a quicker and a more accurate way of measuring slope angle is with a clinometer or an inclinometer. So this actually measures the slope angle with a, an instrument and they're, they're available to purchase at lots of different outdoor stores and things like that. And it's a really good thing to have in your kit. Cause like I said, I'm saying that, that avalanche, uh, sorry, to, um, uh, slope angle is the most important terrain attribute for you to be thinking about. So knowing, being able to check the, the incline of a slope is really, really key. Um, and over time, you can develop an uh, intuitive sense of, of slope angle and, and uh, 
But the real key to this is to measure often to improve your estimates. Your estimates, when you get started, it's, it's amazing how far off your, your estimates of slope angle can be. It's, we see it all the time with uh, newer users in the backcountry who are on relatively flat slopes that think they're on like a 45 degree slope or something like that. And it's very unintuitive to begin with. It takes a lot of practice to really develop your sense of, of uh, uh, estimating slope angle. So we can see here, this slope's too, too low angle. This is your kind of, uh, your green slope at the ski hill. And the, the snow is essentially just held in place by gravity. That said, this person isn't necessarily outside of avalanche terrain. You can see in the distance, there are avalanche paths on the mountain across from the valley. And there may, may well be similar terrain on this same, on, on, on the side of the mountain that this person's on. So just because you're not, on an av a slope that can avalanche doesn't mean you're not in avalanche terrain. That's a pretty key idea. Knowing what's above you is really important. We'll go into more detail on that as well. And here we can see there's a kind of counterintuitive idea where if it's too steep, the snow actually is unlikely to form a slab avalanche because um, it has a tough time accumulating on such a steep slope and it kind of will slough and, and, and fall naturally from the slope as it accumulates rather than forming like a, 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 a thick slab that could produce an avalanche. So basically the snow just can't hold on to this slope. That said, there could still be hazards in a place like this with a slope like that. You could have small sloughs, you could have pieces of cornice or ice falling off of a slope like that. So it's definitely not you know, benign terrain, but it's generally too steep to produce a slab avalanche. And here's just kind of a, a, a helpful graphic that kind of places avalanche terrain in the range of slope inclines that we can see out in the world. Uh, definitely worth noting that in this graphic, when we see the words rare and infrequent, this is specifically referring to slab avalanches. So smaller, loose snow avalanches occur really frequently on, on steeper slopes. So not to be um, overlooked, but when we're talking about slab avalanches, these are the most common slope angles where you'll see uh, avalanche, slab avalanches occurring. Um, so vegetation in terrain is another really important connection to make uh, in terrain evaluation. So it's a, it's a really key terrain characteristic with lots of connections to avalanche concepts, not just the idea of, of uh, avalanche terrain in terms of its capacity to produce an avalanche. So in that, that first idea is, yeah, it, it influences the possibility for avalanches to form but it also influences the consequences of avalanches. You can imagine being caught in an avalanche in a, on a slope like this where there are trees and stumps and things like that could introduce a lot more potential for trauma if you were caught in an avalanche than if the slope were you know, planar with no uh, trees or stumps or things like that. Um, and it also uh, is really important because the vegetation can give us some clues about historical avalanche activity. So maybe if there are no, no trees on the slope, there are reasons behind it and could be due to avalanche activity. And that's how, for instance, in the, the, one of those previous images, I was able to point out avalanche paths in the distance because the vegetation had been cleared out from previous avalanches. So this slope definitely sparse enough trees that an avalanche could form here. And this could actually be really relevant this season if you're recreating in newly burned areas from the, the summer's fires. Those places are totally new pieces of terrain now. So definitely not a place to be um, kind of holding your ideas from last season. That being said there, Colin, one person just typed in the Q&A asking about the burned trees. Do they offer a similar anchorage to the living? Yeah, I would look at those as uh, they, they may have the potential to anchor the snowpack in the same way that they did before they were burned, but the weather effects in that piece of terrain are going to be very different from what they were before the, 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 the trees were burned. So uh, things like wind, solar effect, uh, even the accumulation of snow happens very differently in, a, in an open piece of terrain like that. And uh, like things like tree bombs, uh, masses of snow falling from trees and disrupting uh, layers in the snow, that's much less likely to happen. And again, the, tr the trauma consequences are much, much higher when you're dealing with, with a burn like that. Those kind of carbon hardened spears of, of twigs that are, are stuck on old trees, uh, definitely uh, potential for trauma there. So uh, that anchoring piece, uh, if, if there's an, enough kind of uh, density of trees to anchor the snowpack, that still exists but it's maybe even overcome by all those kind of negative characteristics in terms of the, the capacity for weather effects to really, uh, weather to really have an effect in that, that piece of snowpack or piece of terrain. 
Um, yeah, great. And yeah, I'll just move on from there. Here we have much denser trees. So uh, li uh, likely too dense to form a large enough avalanche to impact us. It's, it's not that it's impossible. It's just generally, it's, uh, you can expect the avalanche to be quite a bit smaller. So the reason is that this vegetation breaks up the size and the uniformity of a potential slab. So a large slab can't, um, it, it, it has a, a difficult time, uh, um, I shouldn't say it has a difficult time, but it is less likely to, um, to kind of have a cohesive form that kind of uh, can trigger all at once uh, than if there are no trees or sparse trees on the slope. Really important as well is that there's also, I think maybe even more important, there's lots of material in these woods that would impede the flow of an avalanche. Maybe not more important, but, but also important that all these trees and variations in terrain if an avalanche were to be triggered in these trees, it would really, uh, it would have a tough time overcoming that uh, variation in terrain and all that, the material that would kind of pose an obstacle to the avalanche, which is a good thing. The other thing to think about though, is that dense trees could act as a terrain trap. And we'll talk more about terrain traps if the setup is a bit different from what we see here. So if the slope was ending, you know, if there's an open slope ending in dense trees, that's much different setup than we, what we see here where you're surrounded in, in totally forested terrain. But we'll talk more about terrain traps. So next, uh, on from vegetation, I wanna talk about triggers, which is kind of like the third per part of the avalanche puzzle, uh, aside from um, snow and terrain. Uh, really important key fact for folks to, to take on is the idea that humans are a really effective avalanche trigger. In fact, humans traveling through avalanche terrain are the most common trigger of avalanches where people are caught. So as you're moving through avalanche terrain, as you're moving through the snow, you can think of yourself as a mobile trigger moving around and tickling the snowpack in all kinds of different places. And hopefully you're not tickling it, tickling it in the wrong place or you're using terrain in a way that it doesn't matter if you do. Um, so this is why it's so important for us to be able to recognize avalanche terrain. There's of course other skills like recognizing signs of instability, following safe travel practices, companion rescue, things like that. But the idea that we are the trigger in avalanche terrain is really important as a take home point. Uh, other kinds of triggers could be objects and these could be either natural or artificial. So natural uh, triggers could be like cornice fall. Like we can see some cornice in the image here. If that were to fall on the slope behind that could certainly provide enough force to trigger an avalanche, uh, rock fall, uh, and then you see uh, explosives mentioned as well. So that's an artificial trigger and that's often used as a mitigating, uh, used by professionals to mitigate avalanche risk. So there's a bit of a mix of natural and artificial triggers there. And then we can think of weather as a really important avalanche trigger as well, natural trigger again. So stormy days when snows are accumulating quickly, this is a time when avalanches become more and more likely. Warm days as temperature rises or if there's strong sunshine, solar radiation, these are natural triggers too. So looking at this image though, you can see it's pretty windy. This person's sheltering themselves from this blasting wind. Um, but so from what we talked about earlier, it doesn't actually look like the piece of terrain that this person is in has enough snow to form an avalanche. However, the terrain above this person, it's out of the frame, we can't really see it. So that's, that's another question. And I'm willing to wager that the wind is blowing in the alpine above this person, at least as hard as it's blowing down in the, in the valley. That's not always the case, but definitely key, uh, key thing to think about the terrain around you, as well as the terrain that you're specifically in, that's kind of directly around you. So just to kind of sum up on those ideas, uh, I've just got a little bit of an animation here, covering the basics, overcoming ground roughness, hitting those key slope angles. The single double black run is kind of your key angle for really, really likely, more, much more likely avalanches. And then your human trigger there. So if you're traveling in the mountains, foothills, anywhere with a slope and there's snow on it, you can pretty much assume that you're in avalanche terrain in some, some form or another. So I, I do wanna discuss a couple of different types of terrain or terrain features. Um, 
that are, that are important to talk about. The first of these is a terrain trap. Really easy way to think about a terrain trap is it's a feature that increases the consequences of an avalanche. So if an avalanche happens here, there's something about the terrain that makes the outcome of that avalanche worse than if it wasn't there, you're looking at a terrain trap. So some examples, as you can see here, we can see like a, a deep gully and the, the, the hazard here is that if an avalanche occurs and you're at the bottom of this gully, you're gonna be buried deeply and that's gonna be really problematic for rescue. Other examples could be cliffs, like we see on the image on the left. If you were trying to take that low angle line off to the looker's left and ski the bowl, but um, you, there's a period of that time where you're exposed to the cliff below as a terrain trap because you could be swept over it if an avalanche was to occur, as we can see has happened here. And then kind of like I was alluding to with the dense trees having potential to be um, a terrain trap as well, you can see here that, that this avalanche has done just that. It's swept from open terrain down into dense trees. And I can imagine that if I was caught in that avalanche being swept into those trees, I would have a really nasty time. Much more potential for, for trauma gets introduced in those, those situations. Uh, I'll keep going, but uh, definitely feel free to keep the, the chat box or sorry, the, uh, the Q&A box firing with questions. Brent will interrupt me if it sounds like a, there's something uh, or seems like there's something that's kind of directly relevant to what I'm, I'm speaking about. And you can also kind of uh, think about questions that you would like to ask by the end too, uh, rather than being put on the spot at the end. Uh, and then you can think of a sharp finish to a slope as another type of terrain trap. So again, on the slope on the left, there's quite a, a dramatic, uh, abrupt stop end to the slope, at kind of the bottom right of the image. And uh, that's a place where a deep burial can, can occur as well. Crevasses on glaciers, so, so holes in the ice, definitely a terrain trap in glaciated terrain. And in non-glaciated terrain, there's something kind of like a crevasse can be a creek, right? So if you're swept into a creek, uh, there's lots of potential for a, a very deep burial, just like with a gully. There's also the potential if you were to get um, submerged in water for hypothermia, for drowning, or even being carried away by water. So really um, a, a place to avoid, I, say, I would say, especially during the er early season when, um, when there's not much coverage on those creeks and the, the, the bridges over them are still quite weak. Um, yeah, and, and in general, it's a place that avalanches are, you're just gonna have a, a greater chance, uh, a consequence, tougher to leave the, uh, the, the flow of the avalanche as well if you're stuck into a, in a gully or a creek. So that's another problematic factor. Another type of terrain to talk about is uh, what's called overhead terrain. So literally this is terrain that's above you. And I kind of alluded to this with a couple of the earlier slides where I'm thinking about what's around the people that we're seeing in these images. Um, so when we talk about overhead hazards, we're referring to terrain above you that contains hazards that have the potential to reach you if they release. So an avalanche runout zone, the, the bottom of an avalanche slope that's threatened by the path above it, this is overhead hazard. Or sorry, uh, the, the, the slope above is overhead hazard. And you can see that in the image here, there's all kinds of overhead ha hazard on this slope. And, hanging out at the bottom of that slope. I can't, I, I don't know if I could think of a day in the winter where I'd feel comfortable in a place like that. Um, especially with those cornices looming large above me. Um, so uh, cornice, rock, ice, uh, other people. So other people in the terrain in combination with the overhead hazard, definitely kind of a complicating factor because people above you could trigger that overhead hazard while you're below. Um, so really key is recognizing wh when, you're, uh, when you're affected by overhead hazard. How do we do it? Really, it's, it's a, 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 one, a key thing to do and to make a habit is to look up. Wherever, whenever you're moving through avalanche terrain, always have an idea of the terrain that's, that's overhead and the potential for uh, hazards to exist in that terrain and the consequences of hazards releasing from that terrain while you're below it. Uh, and, and of course, if you can't see, there, there are times when you can't see overhead hazard, whether it's from visibility from weather or visibility because of how the terrain, how you're situated in the terrain, you can always look at a map, right? Maps, uh, uh, whether it's a paper map or a digital map, you can get a sense of what the terrain above you looks like by doing that. So really important. Um, yeah, and, and managing that hazard is, is key too, because sometimes you, know, you need to make some choices about how you're going to engage with it or if you're going to engage with it. So avoid exposure when possible. 
Uh, but also it's possible to minimize the number of people exposed at one time, as well as the duration of their exposure. So moving quickly through that terrain uh, when avoidance isn't possible, really key uh, strategies to have. Here's another few examples of overhead uh, hazards. So they can be smaller too. We can see in this image, this snowmobiler is about to cross a zone where uh, overhead hazard has um, created, you know, uh, re has released on the terrain that they're moving through. There's still some potential for, for further uh, releases. And when you look at the, the cornices looming over there. And uh, here's a kind of a cool image where the ski tour that we're looking at looks like they might be kind of transitioning into a piece of terrain with overhead hazards. And we can tell by doing a few things. Of course, we, we can look up, right? We can look up and we can see cornices along that ridge. We can see that... Um, there's, they're, they're entering they're, or they're already in a piece of avalanche terrain, right? Because of the slope angle or very likely because of the slope angle, at least run out zones. There's also some vegetation clues. So if we look at that tree on the, on the right-hand side where it's kind of flagged and there's been branches that have been broken off, I'm willing to bet that that happened due to an avalanche. So looking at those clues, looking above you, and when you can't do that, looking at a map, really, really important to maintain awareness of overhead hazards and when you're confronted with them, when you encounter them, manage them. Don't just let them kind of be a part of your day without thinking about how you're gonna deal with them. You need to address them with your group. And you can also look at, it's kind of interesting here. You can see, if you look really closely at this image, you might see like a pine cone or like a pine needles and little twigs that are, have been littered on the slope here. This to me tells me that the wind has been blowing in this area as well. And when I think of wind blowing at this elevation, has the wind been blowing up high as well? most likely, right? So during that time, uh, wind slabs could have been forming, cornices could have been forming, fragile new growth. So really it's important to, this is kind of an aside, but to examine conditions around you, but extrapolate those conditions to overhead terrain. So think about what you're seeing and then imagine what those conditions the, that you're experiencing, how they, they might appear in, in, in terrain that's above you. Especially since, you know, this is, this, this terrain, affects you because it, because if you're in that firing line, you know, it's problematic, right? You're involved. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, man the management of risk in different kinds of avalanche terrain or different kind of uh, classifications of avalanche terrain. So this slide is a bit of an introduction to risk management. There are certain locations in this image where professionals are managing the risk for us. So at a ski resort, we have ski patrollers that um, uh, manage avalanche risk and they, they go through a procedure of opening runs in the morning or, or keeping runs closed, depending on avalanche danger. Um, we also see the public roads here uh, that might, might be managed by the Ministry of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure or by Parks Canada, if you were in a place like Rogers Pass. Um, yeah, and, and basically anything that's not in those areas, you're in the back country. It's, it, it, even if you're right on the line, you know, you just crossed that rope at the ski resort, you just stepped off the rope. This isn't the slack country, you're in the back country. And the, as soon as the, the, where that line is, it means that those agencies that take care of the terrain on the other side of the line, they're not taking care of the, of the terrain in the back country. So it's really, the onus is on us as uh, enthusiasts, as recreationalists to make sure that we're aware that we're um, taking on that risk and to take steps to mitigate that risk. So we'll dive into a little bit of a, the differences between them here too. So driving on public roads, like I said, MOTI or Parks Canada will be preventing people from being involved in, in uh, situations like you can see on the screen here. Um, they'll do things through like highway closures, managing protocol, not stopping in avalanche air areas, using engineered structures, avalanche control with explosives and things like that. It's kind of interesting to think of some of the parallels with how we manage things as recreationalists too. Like we, we don't necessarily stop in avalanche areas as well. And we should consider certain pieces of terrain closed on certain days as well. So we can, we can borrow from these strategies. And remember, as soon as you leave that road, you are in unmanaged backcountry. And this is super relevant for places like Rogers Pass, Kootenay's pa Kootenay Pass, where there's highway access, Pine Pass, where there's highway access, um, avalanche terrain, uh, recreational avalanche terrain. This is, uh, you're, you're in the backcountry at that point, once you're off the road. Here's a cool image of some avalanche control using a, a gas exploder. You can see 
this is not the place you and and it, um you know the, the highways crews will manage who's being exposed or uh, uh, preventing people from being uh, exposed to this while it's going on and then in the ski resort like we talked about the the patrol is, is managing terrain they're using signage to make sure that people understand when they're in an area when they're out of an area when they should exercise caution and when an area is strictly closed and when areas are permanently closed due to high risk. And so, sometimes that's not even due to avalanches. It could just be really nasty terrain that, that are like a permanent closure. And those really are really important things to keep in mind because if you're ignoring a sign like that where it says closed avalanche danger, this could be happening around the corner where you know, you're know you gonna be crossing under the slope where patrol's about to throw a charge onto that slope and, and, and uh, trigger an avalanche that could impact you. So definitely really key to, to obey that signage. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not like your yellow light that you're rushing through or a yield that you kind of rolling stop or something like that. It's definitely really critical. Here's some more um, blasting going on here. Helicopter blasting. Definitely don't want to be on the wrong side of that avalanche. I'd rather be in the helicopter. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, like I was saying, the, the, in the remainder of this terrain, the onus is on us as individuals and as groups. Uh, sometimes there's indicators to let us know when we're entering that terrain, but most of the time there isn't. You know, there, that signage it exists in, in quite, a few, like, uh, quite limited pieces of terrain, kind of access points. So we need to recognize, especially when we're not using those standard access points, that we're the ones entering avalanche terrain and the decision making is up to us. So we make sure we have a safe day by either appropriately managing our risk in that avalanche terrain, or we can avoid it altogether. But it's on us, that responsibility. Here's an example of one of those access points on Mount Seymour in the North Shore of North Vancouver. And uh, you can see that there's some really helpful signage here telling us about avalanche danger ratings, um, terrain rated maps, and things like that, really kind of um, putting a flashing you know, light out there to let anybody know that they're that, that it's crossing this point that they are entering avalanche terrain and it's on them to manage it. But like I said, not everywhere has this and it's, it's really important to know that you're in avalanche terrain when signs aren't posted. What can we use? Things like vegetation clues, right? A topo map to understand the overhead terrain and just evaluating the slopes around you. A general idea, like I was saying, to keep in mind is that if you're in slope terrain, if you're in the foothills and the mountains and there's snow on these slopes, you're in avalanche terrain and you're a trigger that's moving through it. So really important to just to clue into that as it's happening and address it and, and manage your exposure appropriately. Uh, here's a, actually a really cool tool that we offer through the Avalanche Canada website. It's called the Trip Planner or the Trip Planning app. And all kinds of uh, places all over BC, Yukon, uh, Western Canada in general, actually even all, all the way over to Quebec and places like that too, we have uh, rated the avalanche terrain on a scale of uh, simple, from simple to challenging to complex terrain, all with different kind of um, uh, factors in terms of it, the, the severity of the, 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 the potential risk in that terrain if, if avalanche conditions are, are present. And so this can be a really helpful way of, of uh, understanding the kind of terrain that you're going into before you're on the slope looking at it or in the, in the terrain looking at it. You can evaluate it ahead of time and get a sense of whether you're dealing with simple terrain where avalanche danger, uh, avalanche slopes are generally smaller, um, easily identified, easily avoided, all the way to complex terrain where there may be glaciation, crevasse hazards, uh, unavoidable um, uh, avalanche paths overlapping avalanche paths and things like that. So really, really helpful tool there. And it's really cool too, if you engage with this, it, uh, you can apply the, the day's danger ratings to it too, and um, use a kind of a, uh, like we, we have a product called the evaluator, or there's a product called the evaluator that you can use, that gets applied to this product so that you can get a sense of whether certain areas are appropriate for the day's conditions or not. So it's kind of cool, interactive, high-tech little feature, yeah. So we're, this is us, right? We're the people traveling in areas that are, are uh, where the ha avalanche hazard isn't managed by others. So what do we do now? I'm gonna show you a few resources to kind of be on top of this. So the first of, this, of these, like I was saying, is kind of the, the flagship product of Avalanche Canada. So um, 
uh, hopefully you tuned into Ilya Storm's Avcan One Stop Shop presentation a couple of weeks ago. If not, it's recorded and actually posted on our webinars page, and it goes into way more detail than I'll go into here about how to get the most out of the forecast. But essentially, from this page, you're choosing your region. You can learn about the danger ratings that we've rated for the region, kind of for the alpine, tree line, and below tree line areas, elevation bands. Uh, you can learn about the problems that might exist in that region. If there is uh, above a low avalanche danger, there's usually some, there has to be some kind of problem that's associated with it. And then you can get into more detailed avalanche information specific to that region. Things like the snowpack structure, uh, the kind of mountain weather forecast that the forecasters put together, as well as the recent or kind of forecast avalanche activity as well. So really information rich product. It's, it's, uh, it's great. If you haven't checked it out, get on it. And then of course we've got this really cool, like I was, I was saying, I wanted to target some snowshoers here. Uh, we have a new landing page for snowshoers called avalanche.ca slash start dash here. Um, the start here page for snowshoers. So it, it talks about understanding the forecast, uh, recognizing avalanche terrain, kind of like what we're talking about tonight. It goes into a bit more on avalanche conditions recognition. So understanding what signs of instability look like, and what kind of weather pr uh, promotes avalanche activity and links to different tutorials as well. So you can start to build that foundation of your avalanche education. And then uh, if you're, of course, if you're going into, into avalanche terrain, uh, and we talk about this on this page as well, everyone in your group needs to have the following essential equipment and know how to use it. So a uh, transceiver, this is like a radio transmitter receiver that uh, sends out a radio signal in the, in the event of an avalanche, um, those not buried switch their transceiver to search mode and follow the signal toward a buried person. Um, so you need a, a, a modern three antenna digital transceiver, not like an old analog transceiver. Those are basically obsolete at this point. Uh, and even like the two antenna digital transceivers, those are essentially obsolete. We've got really, really great technology these days, and it's more and more accessible than ever. So not too hard to get a good quality transceiver. Uh, Avalanche probe. Um, this, this allows the person who's searching to pinpoint somebody that's buried under the snow really important so you're not wasting time digging. And on the digging side, an avalanche shovel. So lightweight, but not so lightweight that it breaks under, um, under uh, use in an avalanche rescue, something that's designed for avalanche rescue. If, if you're buying it uh, at, a, at a store where you'd buy your kind of sidewalk shovel, it's probably not the, the right shovel. So yeah, this, is, this, this shoveling speed is really critical. It's, it's the most time consuming part of a rescue and that time can be the difference between life and death. This is actually one of the most exciting new features of the AVCAN website. Uh, great way to kickstart your avalanche education. It's called AVI Savvy, and we kind of promoted it in the, that splash video at the beginning. Uh, we covered a few of the ideas here this evening, especially the terrain ideas, but there is a lot more to check out. So how to navigate forecasts, uh, develop a daily process, understanding companion rescue, all the foundational elements are there. Information on our AST courses or the, the uh, the curriculum that we developed for avalanche skills training and uh, where you can uh, uh, hook up with an instructor to take that course or another avalanche training course. And then, yeah, just to sum up, I, I want to make sure that people understand um, the, the whole reason behind this is to make sure that you understand what makes avalanche terrain, the kinds of conditions where and the, really the places where avalanches are possible and being aware of the risks, whose responsibility they are, and if they're your responsibility in those places, how to be prepared, how, what to bring with you, and uh, knowing, of course, where to access more information. Hint, avalanche.ca, right? So inform yourself. So just before wrapping it up, I just wanna um, end on a bit of a philosophical note for folks to ponder between now and your next trip in the mountains and beyond. You may have heard this old adage, I've left a blank because I've seen a few different variations on what fills this blank. So unstable snow is the classic one. So if it's unstable snow, snowpack, avalanches, conditions, whatever it is, another piece of this risk calculation that goes in here, the idea is that risk management is hard. It's really, really, it's a struggle. A professional struggle with it every day they go out into avalanche terrain. Strong terrain choices act as an antidote to some of the most challenging aspects of that assessment. Snowpack structure, the presence or trend of an avalanche problem, even human factors can all be really tough to accurately assess. 
factor in and then weigh in your risk assessment. This is because they all carry some kind of uncertainty or another. So terrain is one of the very few things in our risk assessment that is not clouded in uncertainty. It's as fixed and as real as the ground under your feet and the mountains around you. So in the uncertain world that is avalanche risk management, we really do need to make the most of the certainties that we can grasp. Terrain is the ultimate certainty when uncertainty plagues your mind. It's like our silver bullet, our phone a friend, our physical, not magical shield that protect, protects us from avalanches when we aren't sure what's what in the rest of the world. So the goal is to use terrain to your advantage and stack the odds in your favor. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. And I think I went a little over time, but I think that's okay if there are some really good questions. Brent, have we got some in the queue? Yeah, I'm just looking here. A uh, first one off, is there a cost for an AST training course? Uh, yeah, there, there will be. Uh, Avalanche Canada doesn't actually provide Avalanche training. We create the curriculum for Avalanche providers to um, provide that training, and we license those Avalanche, uh, Avalanche Canada training providers as well. Uh, and all of those different training providers will they'll, they'll, uh, apply a cost of some, some kind to account for the, the guided time, the instruction, uh, their time, the, the uh, rental of venues and those kinds of things. That said, that's the, those are the courses, right? So when it comes to the tutorials, Avi Savvy, the Learn page, all that stuff on the Avalanche Canada website, all free to use and very much encouraged to use. I got, we've, we've had a few in the Q&A box. We've been answering them as we've been talking there, Colin. Right on. The thing that was brought up, like one person mentioned, my, my magnetic goggles, can they give me interference with my transceiver? And I, I, I gave a list to most folks that, there's multiple things that can interfere with your transceiver. Maybe you wanna elaborate a little bit on transceiver interference. Yeah, absolutely. Transceiver interference is a real issue. And it's especially an issue now with more and more digital devices that we're bringing, us out, that we're bringing with us out into the field. Uh, it, 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 in, in essence, it actually doesn't even need to be a, a digital device. Even having like a piece of tin foil in your front pocket over your transceiver can be act as interference as well. But certainly any devices like a phone, a GoPro camera, or a radio, or um, uh, satellite messaging devices, all of these things can and, and will interfere with the function of your transceiver, both its ability to transmit as well as its ability to, to receive signals. So the, the kind of rule of thumb here uh, that you should be following is that when you're in transmit mode, moving around through terrain, your, your transceiver is beeping away, you should keep those uh, devices uh, 30 centimeters away from your, 20 to 30 centimeters, I think is the general guideline, away from the transceiver and ideally turned off, right? And if you're keeping these things turned on, they should be further away. But the, the, the rule here is turned off 20 to 30 centimeters away. If you're moving into search mode with your transceiver, much higher likelihood of interference. And it's important to get those devices even further away from your transceiver. The, the recommendation is 50 centimeters away from your searching transceiver, and especially then they should be turned off. Um, I think it's worthwhile to practice with your transceiver in situations where interference might exist so that uh, you get a sense of what it takes to overcome that obstacle in your, in, your, in your search, because it can happen. It might not even be your device that's doing it. It could be somebody else's overcoming those obstacles and getting to know the behavior of your transceiver when it's confronted with interference, I think is a good thing. Okay, I think with that, maybe we can hand it back to Brent unless there are more, some more questions. Uh, we've got a few questions popping in here. Um, one is, you know, back to that transceiver thing again, people are, you know, they're wondering the lithium or alkaline battery. Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. In uh, their model of transceiver. Yep, yep. So for most transceivers, you're going to want to use alkaline batteries. Some transceivers have a, a lithium setting, so you can move to lithium batteries. Uh, I still don't really recommend using lithium batteries. The key with a lithium um, battery is that the discharge rate isn't... Uh, isn't steady and they tend to uh, have really, really high uh, uh, or strong power 
uh, up until the very end of their life cycle where it drops dramatically. So if you were using a transceiver that doesn't have a lithium setting and you had lithium, lithium batteries, batteries in there, you might say, you might see 100%, 100% for weeks. And then when you go to use it in a search, it could rapidly move from like 90% to zero as it reaches the end of that, that discharge cycle on the lithium battery. Uh, even though they're better with cold temperatures, it, it just doesn't matter because of that discharge rate and alkaline batteries have a more, uh, a steadier kind of linear uh, discharge rate and the, and the transceivers are better able to show you where your battery is at. When, when you have a lithium setting on, it's actually not even um, measuring your, the, the charge from your battery, it's, it's on a timer instead. So you, you set and reset the timer when you put those old batteries or the lithium batteries in. So I prefer personally to have a sense of where my batteries are at um, in a linear sense, rather than on like in, in, in relation to the power discharge, rather than in relation to how long I've had them in the, the transceiver. We have a couple of folks here ask, what do I do? Or are there some types of steps when I get caught in avalanche? Are there like mm -hmm. avalanche survival techniques? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to talk about these. So number one, uh, it's really important that everybody around you knows that you've been caught in an avalanche. You need to yell the word avalanche at the top of your lungs. Everybody around you, everybody in the mountains should know that an avalanche has happened. Everybody back in town should hear that there's an avalanche by the, by the sound of your voice. Um, as you're doing that, you need to ski or move aggressively out of the flow of the avalanche, whether that's a right turn, a left turn, do whatever you can to move um, sideways out of the flow of the avalanche. The name of the game here is not getting caught in the flow of that avalanche get away to the sides as, as rapidly, as aggressively as you possibly can. If that's not enough and you're starting to get caught in the flow of the avalanche, you need to fight. So uh, using swimming motions to keep your, 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 yourself at the top of the slope, grabbing onto tree branches, pieces of rock, whatever you can, digging your claws in into that slope to prevent yourself from being kept in the flow of the avalanche. The longer you're in that flow, the more chance for trauma and the, more ch the, the greater chance of ending up in the deposit at the bottom of the slope in a deep burial. So really trying to, doing everything you can to stay out of the flow of the avalanche. Uh, this is a good time to ditch your pack if you have the ability to do so. Uh, in fact, as you're struggling, the, maybe the first thing to do, I didn't mention this because I wasn't thinking avalanche airbags, but if you have an airbag, once you feel that you're getting caught in the flow and that you're not going to be able to get out of the avalanche, you need to pull your avalanche airbag so that it can protect you and prevent you from being more deeply buried if you, if you find yourself at the bottom. Um, so you're tumbling down the slope. There's not much you can do at this point because you're kind of, you, you've lost control. I can't really, there's not much of an expectation for you to manage that kind of chaos, but there is another, there's one last opportunity for you to make a really solid effort to improve the, the odds of your rescue. As the avalanche uh, comes to a stop at the bottom of the slope and you haven't been able to, to take yourself out of that flow, you want to do what you can to reach up and out of the snow surface so that, that there's a visible clue on the surface, i.e. You, I, 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 you are on the surface in some capacity, and to sweep away snow from your face so that there's some form of an air pocket um, under the snow. And at that point, it's really important to simply relax, to breathe slowly, to not um, consume the, uh, all of the, the oxygen that's been, that might be available to you in that air pocket that you've made for yourself and just try to um, relax and wait for rescue. And if you, if you start to feel, hear people near you moving through the snow and you can hear their voices, make your voice heard as well. You can let them know that you're, you're there and you're looking forward to seeing them. Like we're getting a flurry in here now, Colin. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, great. A couple folks, what about inflatable backpacks? And then, you know, people are getting really deep in the thought pattern here. You know, is there a ratio between snowboarding airbag versus skiing airbag on statistics? Mm, um, I'm not sure. About airbags in general. Yeah, I'm not sure statistic wise whether they're like like based on conveyance, whether the odds are better on a ski, on ski snowboard or, or sled or snowshoe. 
I don't think there's been much research uh, like based on the kind of your conveyance, whether they work better or not. What we do know about airbags is that they, they do work better. They, 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 um, uh, they're, they're, I guess the benefits in the airbag are, are more uh, present in a place where there are, there's less potential for trauma on the slope. So if it's a heavily treed slope, if there are cliffs, if there are things that like we're talking about terrain traps, where being brought to the bottom of the avalanche introduces a lot of opportunities for trauma. This is where uh, the, the jury's still out a little bit on the benefits of an airbag because it has the potential to protect you from some of that trauma because of the in inflated bag around your head and neck. It also, at the same time, increases the odds of you being brought to the bottom of the slope. So there's a bit of a, a judgment call there about whether, or at, le at least a, a, a debate that's, that's, that's valid there in terms of whether the types of terrain that an airbag's benefits are, are, are most uh, felt, the, felt the most. And like a smooth planar slope with a, with a gentle run out, uh, much better uh, uh, performance from the airbag there because it's not, there, there's no significant trauma introduced by, by staying in the avalanche. And uh, it's, it's really effective at keeping you on top of the debris. That's the whole idea of the airbag is it makes you a larger particle and larger particles in motion tend to uh, end up on the top of the, the, the debris of the deposit. Sorry. Anything else from the floor? Just trying to keep up here on the, in the <laughs> I'm typing up a storm. Um, we're going to yeah, take uh, two more questions here and then we're going to move on to the next presenter. Great. Um, would you suggest any good apps or maps when out in the back country, um, especially mm. if you're not using your phone? And if you do go to a paper map, I'm trying to combine a couple questions here. Okay. You get a paper map. A lot of people in the Q&A were talking about how do I access paper maps and if not what's oh yeah okay so a few ideas here um, in terms of apps that have really great um, uh, like if we're talking digital maps uh, I really like Gaia GPS for its um, ability to kind of you can work with data quite on a pretty deep level with Gaia and the between using Google Earth to create tracks and, and things like this and, and moving them into Gaia is really quite straightforward. Um, there's an issue with Gaia right now where uh, I, I expect it's going to be a re resolved soon where their really great 3D imagery is only available on their desktop website. And when you go to use the mobile app, it's all 2D. So that's a bit of a strike against. And where I'd say a map, an app that really overcomes this or kind of um, wins out on, on the Im 3D imagery on the go would be FatMap. Now, FatMap, I would say, doesn't have that same ability to work with data really, really nicely the way that Gaia GPS does. But um, its 3D imagery is astonishing. So I actually use a bit of a combination with, in, in terms of trip planning and kind of knowing where I am in, on, the, on the kind of large scale of navigation. I like to use Gaia and I can use my tracks and my waypoints and things like this much more intuitively. But then if it comes to me just being in the terrain, wondering where that trailhead is on the kind of micro scale or where's that you know, pillow field or this, this avalanche slope or this run out or this nicely uh, gladed section of trees, that's where I'll go to fat map. And it's amazing how much you can zoom in on terrain and see tracks and pine martens and all kinds of things. No, it's very detailed, it's amazing, yeah. Uh, and then in terms of paper maps, uh, the government of Canada uh, some time ago moved away from uh, selling them, uh, kind of got out, got out of the business of selling maps. And so they basically made all their, uh, all their map information free on the GOBC website. Um, there, it can be a bit tricky to find the one to 50,000 scale. It's a little bit easier to find the one to 20,000 scale, but the one to 50,000s are out there on the government, in the government resource, uh, government of Canada resources, mapping resources. Um, and in BC, the GOBC, I want to say .com or .gov, I, I'm not sure. You can probably just Google GOBC topo maps and you'll find it pretty easily. Uh, that's where you'll find the, a lot of the stuff for, or all of the stuff for BC. 
Um, they're great maps, uh, but now you have to print them yourself. So you, there's a, um, a few outlets that'll do this for you. I, I can think of in the in Squamish. I know that Valhalla Pure will do this. And I'm, I think in a lot of different mountain towns, there's one or another printing outfit that has been asked enough time to produce maps for people that they'll, they'll actually print them for you. And sometimes on like waterproof paper and things like that too. So that can be good if you want that government issue map. For a lot of the most popular touring zones, like in the Duffy area, Duffy Lake area, Whistler, uh, a lot of the kind of the coast range, um, popular zones in the Cascades as well. A fellow named John Baldwin, explorer extraordinaire, has produced a series of maps that are really, really great that show all kinds of ski terrain, really nicely marked up with terrain shading and with uh, up tracks and down lines and things like that. Uh, that's really good. And I, I think a lot of outdoor stores actually, and there's a few competitors to the Baldwin maps that are starting to pop up here and there too, which I think is great. There's all, I think you're really, really starting to get spoiled for choice in terms of maps and uh, paper maps in, especially in those really high use areas, like really popular zones. We're seeing more and more of that stuff. Um, and I think it, the, there is a still value in, in carrying a paper map with you. You know, it's never going to run out of batteries. You can do traditional navigation with a, with a compass with it. And um, yeah, it's just that your hard copy, if you want to save batteries on your, on your, um, uh, but I, I think there's a bit of value in both car carrying both these days because, you know, carrying an app doesn't add any weight to your phone and carrying a paper map doesn't really add much weight to your pack either. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Colin. Cool. Thanks, buddy, for uh, the interaction here. And we're going to move on to Sandra Riches from BC Adventure Smart. And uh, we'll get her to queue up. And as we're waiting for her to queue up there, you can uh, be prepared to ask questions of Sandra later when she's done. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm really grateful to be joining you tonight from the traditional territory of Coast Salish people. And I have some great information to share with you. Thanks, Colin. I was making notes while you were going all through those answers. It was some really great information that I know we can share as well on the Adventure Smart platforms uh, for little tips and tricks here and there. So I'll be in touch, Colin. That was great presentation. Uh, my name is Sandra Riches. I'm the executive director of the BC Adventure Smart program. Uh, our main focus tonight, this is a condensed version of one of our programs. We have curriculum underneath our umbrella that consists of five different programs. And this is a, a mini version of our Survive Outside program. Uh, it really just focuses on the three T's, which is if you've come across this before, literally at a trailhead, a ski hill, special event, uh, a gathering um, on, online, on our socials, you, you've seen this before. Uh, so it might be a refresher or an intro for some of you. And the main thing we have, it's our foundation of what we do. Is, is we want you to trip plan, train and take those essentials and add that season and sports specific gear that Colin just, just talked about specific to winter trans Saber Shovel Pro, but there's just a few extras. Um, before I kick off, I'd just like to give you a little history. Adventure, Adventure Smart started uh, just a little over 17 years ago. Uh, the BC Search and Rescue Association started it, mainly because this province has more search and rescue calls than the rest of the country. Uh, every year now, we have just under 2,000 search and rescue calls just in British Columbia. There are 79 search and rescue groups and there's about 3,000 search and rescue volunteers. Those members consist of 2,500 active members and about 500 members in training. Um, we're part of that system. We're one big happy family. Their response, we're incident prevention and we're here to increase awareness so that we can help reduce the number and severity of search and rescue calls. Well, it boils down to you, not me. <laughs> I share the information. My team and I um, increase awareness and, and you go into action. So it's a call to action to you pretty much. Based on that success in the first five years, the federal government, Public Safety Canada, wanted to see Adventure Smart in every province and territory. So luckily for us, uh, the program went national in 2009. So there is representation right across the country from coast to coast to coast. And the message is the same, no matter where you go, no matter where you receive this presentation, virtually, in person, online, it will focus around these three T's. What's unique about what we get to do in BC is we're funded by the BC Search and Rescue Association through Emergency Management BC. And we have a full team. Uh, we have a different model in the province and, and have that longevity underneath our belt based on um, starting it uh, 17 years ago. 
Tonight, I'm going to jump into these three. If you want more detail on these three and, and everything else I talk about tonight, join us for some of our upcoming soon to be announced uh, regular snow safety education programs. We've got some kickoff events coming as well. And we'll jump into these in finer detail, our presentations in whole for each one of our programs are 60 minutes. It's about 45 minutes and then some Q&A similar to tonight's um, session. So let's talk a little bit about trip planning, training, taking those essentials, and don't forget that extra seasonal and sport specific gear. But before I move on to the next slide, I just have one question to come up. I have two out, two more after this too. Um, I'm just curious if you know what to do um, if you were lost. I, I'm always like, I always like to ask everyone what their what their knowledge is about what they would do if they were lost in trouble or hurt out there, and how would that um, uh, affect how quickly they would call for help. So if we could pull up that question, then we can take some time to answer that. So if you're lost in trouble or hurt in the mountains, when? When should you call for help? Wait about two hours and then call. Uh, about one hour, maybe. Take some time to figure things out, ASAP, or try to get out yourself. Uh, you might be familiar with seeing search and rescue in the news. I think all of us have, especially on the South Coast. There's certain regions that have more calls than others. And, and we know by data-driven insights that the South Coast is a huge influx of hiker incidents uh, in the summertime throughout the corridor um, uh, down here in the lower mainland. And then in the winter time, we know for shorts sure in the East Kootenays and it's specific to backcountry skiers, snowshoers and sledders, actually sledders top that list. Um, and that's data driven. It's not Sandra, I'm just throwing out some information there. But so if you're lost in trouble with any of those activities or whatever you choose to do, um, how quickly should you call? Wait two hours, 2%, I'm glad it was only two. We'd like that to be zero. 7% uh, would be one, ASAP is most of you and try to get out yourself. So let's never try to get out ourselves. And, and we always wanna make sure that we phone as soon as possible. It takes a while to activate search and rescue. Uh, you phone uh, a number, that's my next question. I'll wait to give you the answer. Uh, and then it takes a while to activate it and go through a system before you will have the search and rescue group in your region activated before they assess, make sure it's safe for you to get out to you. So you wanna make that call as soon as possible. Training is, is essential and there's specific points to it. Here's just a little comparison that we've got uh, to think about, about planning your travel route and your nav and knowing the terrain and the conditions. Um, you know, we can think about, uh, you know, this season's terrain feature uh, as we use our example tonight. So we've got a really smooth, well-groomed surface trail there in the middle and then a little bit of a route in the bottom one that's actually Sigurd Peak. Um, uh, and so the comparison there in terrain and everything has to match your abilities, your skills and your knowledge and your group dynamics. How does this work for your group? Maybe you're skilled, maybe someone else is completely unaware. That all needs to be assessed and discussed before you head out there. And you need to check into that weather, the likelihood of precipitation, uh, temperature gradient, wind, precip, sunset time. Your activity ideally is fitting in that window of sunset, pardon me, sunrise to sunset. And as it gets shorter now, we, we had a smaller window to play there. So if something goes wrong in that window and you need to call for help, then there's um, a bit of a, a smaller window there for you to have daylight, warmer temperatures, so much changes then it really does change there. So looking into those finer details, uh, like Colin mentioned and checking forecasts and, and including as much as you can in that trip planning phase, of, of starting with us, starting with Avcan, and then you have many other steps along the way before you actually hit the path or the trail or the snow. Trip planning is a big one, it, it, and this extends into the other phase. So I always take our trip planning section and divide it into two. We need to make a plan, and then we need to file a trip plan. And that can be done easily by firing off a text to your emergency contact with all the details, when you're going, who's going with you, um, your route there and back, the color of your clothing, everything that you have with you, some contact phone numbers. And if they don't hear from you by a certain amount of time, they need to try to reach you. And if they can't, they need to call for help. So we're gonna watch a really short video. It talks about our trip plan app and we've made this tool for you. It's relatively new, it's just a couple years old and it's a little bit different than Avcans there that Colin talked about. This one is going to help you make your plan for your adventure, no matter what it is, no matter the season. Um, the app is free, it's easy to use, and it helps you make your plan if you're not too sure what that should look like. And then it allows you to file that with an emergency trusted contact. So let's have a peek at that and, uh, and we can watch that here.
there we go. You'll get a chance to access that through a QR code when we get to the end of the presentation. But, it, it, you know, this has to all go to an emergency trusted contact. So, Nancy, if you don't mind pulling up the next question, it's, it's about calling this person, um, um, the number to call, actually. And so uh, when you need help, who should you call first? This is really important. So whoever you figure out this is, you need to have a conversation with them because they have a huge role to play. Should it be your friend that knows the trail of the area? your parents, wife, brother, a family member, because they'll be worried. They, they're going to be worried for sure. Um, RCMP or your local police or search and rescue volunteers. So these are some pretty good choices here. Some of the options might look inviting. Uh, I'm curious to see which one uh, you, you all gravitate to. This has happened in so many great ways and proved successful. There's been many um, incidents for search and rescue where people didn't phone the right person as soon as they should have. Uh, and, and it delayed search and rescue. And unfortunately, the, the search, and, search and rescue incident didn't end well. So this is a really big piece to know who to phone and, and, and so that that action can be put into place. Picking your trusted emergency contact is a big deal. Uh, and, and it's gotta be really, really strategic. So your friend who knows the trailer area, I understand why you would lean that way, for sure. Um, your parents or your family, I understand why you would pick that too. Um, RCMP or your local police, definitely. Um, and then, or search and rescue volunteers. They don't have a number. You, you can't phone them. I have 3,000 friends who are search and rescue volunteers. I can't phone them if I'm in trouble. Well, I could, but they're going to tell me to go back and phone the police. Uh, so, when you need help, who should you call first? Definitely, it's 911. And, and that will, that puts that that action into play for the local search and rescue group close to you because uh, search and rescue um, are only tasked out by RCMP or the local policing agency um, and a couple of others, but you need to phone 911 and ask for police and they will task out search and rescue. Awesome. Let's jump into training for a bit. This is continuous. You're getting trained tonight comfortably, happily at home. Uh, Colin Sarah, shared some awesome information. Go ahead. You gotta share your uh, PowerPoint. After the video. Was it not on past my? No, you got to go back to the screen share again. Sorry. Okay, got it. Are we there? Not quite. Okay, no problem. Okay. Just sitting on that screen the whole time. Sorry, everybody. No problem. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. Training. Thanks, Brent. That's great. Uh, we've chunked it into five little sections here. It makes it easy for you to digest so that you can, can chew on this. There's more. There can be more. But what needs to be done, it needs to be continuous. Uh, again, like I said, tonight is some of it with Colin and I. Uh, any of our other sessions and AVCAN sessions are all part of this. There's activity-specific skills training, which would be your AST, uh, uh, maybe companion rescue, uh, maybe communications, navigation, map and compass, there's so much more to take that's activity specific. Um, and think about that in off season too, how you could complement your skills for upcoming seasons. Physical fitness is big. You know, some of us love the gym, some of us hate the gym. Some of us ride for fun, some of us ride to keep in shape. Some of us don't do anything. And then the snow flies and then we're ready to go. Keeping that physical fitness maintained is, is super helpful. And it, of course it is for our activities, but in an emergency, you'll need it as well. And I also like to add mental wellness and mental training as well. We need to think of these what ifs, think of these emergency situations and be prepared for the unexpected. Be prepared for the what if, which is a biggie. Nav and route finding, Colin talked about that a little bit too. Um, and, and knowing how to use the gear that you're carrying and that you can actually manage your way through this terrain and, and read it and understand it and compare it to the forecast, compare it to the ratings and, and, and use all this and reconcile it all together to come up with a plan. Wilderness first aid, biggie. Um, three of the top reasons for search and rescue in BC based on data is first one is injury. Second one is lost and disoriented. And the third one is exceeding abilities. Injury can happen in any of those, even though it's titled as the first. So having some wilderness first aid and rescue and emergency training is our big pieces to be able to have in your back pocket and then literally have that in your pack with your gear ready to roll and knowing how to use it. Taking the essentials, this is our foundation of our pack. This is the basics. This is, this is um, 
the this is the beginning really. Um, we've divvied it up here and put a little red sack with a few items and the list is the headlamp and flashlight extra batteries of course fire making kit as long as you know how to use it and manage your fire efficiently signaling device emergency safety whistle a signaling card in case uh, search and rescuer in an aircraft first aid kit pocket knife sun protection and emergency shelter that easily fits into that red sack in the top left corner of the picture and then you just have a few more things and those are your basics that's, that's, your, that's my foundation of my pack when I'm snowshoeing. That's the foundation of my pack when I'm mountain biking. It's the foundation of my pack when I'm doing any activity outside. And then I add to it season and sport specific. So here's one example, and there's more gear than this, don't get me wrong, to, to backcountry skiing. But the main piece to this is the top left square, that those essentials stay the same. You know, we have some really amazing access to awesome terrain throughout the province, but main, mainly close to high density areas where we have high population. Let's use the corridor up towards Pemby, Whistler, Squamish, down through the North Shore as one example. Two million plus up to, up to the North Shore mountains, easy access, and it can really give a false sense of security when it's so easy to get to. We often think, ah, I don't need this. I don't need my micro spikes. I don't need that extra layer. You do. Most of the calls in the country happen in that region that I just mentioned. So being cognizant of what we're carrying and making sure that um, it's always there. And then you just add to it season and sports specific. And don't forget those extra personal ones outside of the extra pieces of gear that we've got listed here. Maybe it's your favorite trail mix. Maybe it's uh, something special you need for medication. Maybe you need to bring these now and always have some glasses in there to read those maps and to read your phone. Uh, so those extra pieces will get you through a tricky situation as well. The three T's we just went through, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. This is a big piece in my almost 20 years um, with uh, Adventure Smart. And prior to that, I was a BC Park Ranger for 12 years. And, and what I've noticed throughout my career in outdoor recreation is people don't know what to do in this emergency. It, it's really a panic scene or, or there's worry, there's anxiety, there's fear, there's cold, there's weather, there's an injury, you're lost. Uh, you've been separated. There's so much going on and granted that will happen. But if you know what to do in this situation, you can take control. The biggest thing, and we teach us when we deliver our children's program, which is Hug a Tree and Survive, we need you to stop. Search and Rescue need you to stop moving. And we've made it really simple with this analogy is you need to stop. Then you can think, observe around for hazards, plan with the gear you have with you. So by stopping, it allows you to stop getting into further trouble. Uh, by thinking, you're thinking of your communication plan. Did I leave that trip plan? Does my cell phone work? Do I have enough battery on my phone? Am I using my navigation equipment? Am I using my extra communication devices, Spot, Zolio, InReach, Sat phone? Am I observing for safety where we are? Is it safe to be here? Are cornices above us, like Colin mentioned, are we in a safe area that, that's free of further hazard? Um, and then you can plan. You can plan how to communicate. You can plan how to keep warm. You can plan how to eat and drink what you've carried with you. You can plan how to apply first aid. And, and you know that if all else fails with the gear that you have with you, you know you've left that information back with your trusted emergency contact. And all that detail is in your trip plan. And your communications now with help is your emergency contact. And they know to call 911 because they can't reach you. And then search and rescue is activated. So you, that pre um, trip planning is key. I like to mention this extra piece here is, is you've stopped, which is great. You've done the other things there, but don't go down. People are, are really um, keen to help themselves and to get out of the situation and not bother family, not bother search, search and rescue, maybe not get in the news. Uh, there's many things that will go through your mind, but um, stopping is the key, calling for help, making sure that's in, in place and don't follow a creek. Don't go down a gully drainage, natural draws, or water courses, they more than likely will get you in further trouble, or um, uh, they can be fatal. So your, your best end, you should always stop and stay put. My last uh, poll, and then I only have a couple more slides and I'm, I'm done here. So if Nancy, if you don't mind pulling up, that would be awesome. And then I'll just finish off with my last few slides and answer any questions that we might have here. So when you're choosing an emergency contact, which we've talked a lot about, to leave your plan with, who should that person be? Um, a close family member, like your, one of your parents, maybe, a guardian, an ex-partner, a forgetful friend, 
person who knows you well knows the area and is trustworthy. I know when I create the um, the trail trip plans on my app, I, I have a few trusted emergency contacts that I leave in there, and I've got I've got my app, my trip plan set up for snowmobiling, snowshoeing, uh, mountain biking, hiking, and I leave them there as those four, for lack of what else I do, and then I just tweak them each individually. I go back in, I change the date, maybe the route. My essentials are always there. I add extra season and sport, and I fire it off to my emergency contact. Great, awesome, you pass, <laughs> thanks, that's good. Person who knows you well, that's, that's the way to go. They're trustworthy and they know the area. Um, we can use our family, some do. They're really going to worry and maybe won't get, go into as much strategic um, emergency planning and communicating with whoever they need to. Um, so that person, that bottom one is great. Um, good luck to that one person who picked ex, ex partner, unless you're great friends, maybe it's still a good thing. <laughs> it could very well be. Thanks, Nancy. Making the right call. If you've been following social media at all lately, you will have seen a few things going out there that um, uh, there's been some confusion on when you should call, who you should call. We cleared it up a little bit with our poll tonight, and, and that was a biggie. So making the right call is key. So you know now we've kind of chatted about it a few times. It's always 911, either through you if you've got comms and you can do it, if you've got reception or it will be through your trip plan, through your emergency contact. That's your first, first action that should happen after you've stopped, of course. How do you relay that information? You need to know how to find your coordinates on your phone or your device. Um, on the trip plan app, the Adventure Smart Trip Plan app, there's a little arrow, you just press it and it gives you latin long, gives you latitude and longitude, and then you have that to offer police when, when you contact them, if that's all in order. Um, Search and Rescue also have a system that's in place and they do not recommend a third party application for, for any um, mapping of your location. Uh, they've got it pretty dialed. They've been at this a while and it's a good system. So Search and Rescue have the ability to access your location um, also via um, a ping network, a, ne a network ping. And, and Search and Rescue might, if there's reception, and I know some groups locally down here on the coast, will actually use text messaging to communicate with you. So there is a possibility that they might just be communicating through with you through a text if, if that works. You know, trying to figure out location, how you're doing, letting you know where they are. Maybe they're just mustering or gathering before they're coming and they're able to communicate with you already. Maybe you're able to text back that the, the injury is worse than you thought or, or someone else is missing. Like, so that could be a possibility. That could be a way that communication uh, does happen. Last but not least, uh, you can always stay in touch with us if you haven't already. All of our socials are at the same one there. You can connect with us. And, and we do offer some great events coming up, just like Avcan is. And you can take your phone now and go to your camera mode if you haven't done it already. Scan it over that uh, QR code. It'll take you straight to the app, which is free, easy to use, and uh, we're here to help. But thanks for joining us tonight and getting informed before you go out, before the snow flies, so that we can all have a good time out there. And on behalf of our 3,000 search and rescue volunteers, thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about how you can reduce the number and severity of a search and rescue call if it happens to you. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Great talk, Sandra. We do have uh, one gentleman who's been very patient and had his hand up here, Bill Pike. Um, did you have a question from the floor, Bill? Just checking to see if you uh, had a question there, Bill. You had your hand up. He's muted there. Yep. And it looks like that may have just been in a, a mistaken hand. And I did see Adam Ammon had his hand up there briefly. Did you want to ask a question there, Adam Ammon? Um, I never had my hand up. I'm not sure what was going on. All right. Pardon me. All right, looks like um, we've had a couple questions. We've uh, dealt with it. Um, can people still access your location if your phone dies right after you contact them? Yeah, that's why we encourage, and I think Colin maybe have talked about it a little bit too, is make sure that you're heading out there to do your thing with your phone off. You want to save that battery, take a battery, extra power pack, um, battery pack, pardon me, uh, travel with it in airplane mode. 
and use it as little as possible so that you can actually save that battery power because once you don't have that you're relying on your your trip plan and your communication piece that's been in place um, outside there so if you've got extra battery power to 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 make that suffice you know the weather really affects our devices our phones my phone doesn't love the cold i'm sure yours doesn't either so without that um we're relying on that trip plan communication piece that we left behind with our contact. And we got a couple other questions here. I know one I've seen it so much in social media lately, you know, is advising people against the uh, this post that's telling people to change their voicemail uh, when you're out there lost. I'm, you know, I've seen a lot of debunking of that already. A, you're probably not going to have any cell service in order to change it. Um, and then with that in mind, I think uh, we also have another person, you know, maybe another social media item here. Um, if you don't have reception, if you turn on and off airplane mode and send a text to 911, is that true? Yeah, texting is an option. Um, and, and on our app, we have an emergency button that you can use. Trail Forks has an emergency button. Our phones have an emergency button. So there's ways to get that out. Uh, if you have reception, you know, when we talk about this with our survive outside program, when we get into this a little bit further, we talk about taking other communication devices. I, when I head out, I'm not relying on my phone. If it works great, that's, that's a bonus if that's the case. Otherwise, it's a Zolio, it's, it's a sat phone if you've got that, and, and, or if it's an inReach or spot device, and you know what they're capable of, you know what the features are, how they work, if they work in conjunction with your phone. Uh, and, and making the effort to do some homework into what those devices can do for you. So you've got that comms piece, you know, and you're, and you're confident that you can have that communication piece um, in place in case something does go wrong. I wouldn't head out there without an additional piece of communication outside of your phone. You're muted. Sorry, Sandra. Thank you. Clicking on multiple boxes here. Uh, a few people have mentioned, um, you know, those other devices you touched on the inReach, the Zolio, you know, uh, spot devices. Those are satellite communication features. Um, another people are talking about social media and tagging responsibly in the social media. And what does that really mean, like tagging responsibly? You know, we put out a few things re recently in regards to um, making the right call, the voicemail um, viral post that we tried to debunk with so many of us in North America. That was just crazy. Um, uh, what three words, you know, and, and there's misinformation and there's reliable information and knowing where the source is for that reliable information so that you can share that if you choose to. Um, you know, Avalanche Canada is an awesome resource. We're an awesome resource. There's providers out there who offer avalanche uh, safety training. So knowing that whoever you're choosing to share their information is a reliable source. Um, outside of what we put on for public, we also train volunteer outdoor educators to share our curriculum. And search and rescue volunteers have joined us to be our volunteers, teachers, scout leaders, ambassadors, forecasters, uh, guides. There's, there's a wealth of people. We have over 500 volunteers who've joined our volunteer team to share our reliable information. And that's either sharing our curriculum that we train them in, or it's using our boilerplate messaging to share those three T's. Uh, it's sharing our trip plan app information. It's, it's, it's sharing just the QR. You know, there's ways to share reliable information um, from us. So if that's of interest, we just did an intake October 27th, the next one's in the spring, but, but we can help you out in the short term with some other stuff as well that's a little bit more condensed. We're also going to offer a media creator training workshop in the spring for those social media uh, creators who share some awesome, awesome um, posts, but they also can add value by including adventure smart messaging. It's kind of like what Destination BC does, BC Parks, Parks Canada, when they post something now in relation to outdoor recreation, they often include our boilerplate messaging. It's reliable information. They tag us appropriately and it connects people to the resource for responsible recreation and to, to learn more about Adventure Smart Resources. I think we've kind of covered majority of the questions here. There was 
quite a few coming in. Uh, Colin's popping on here. Yeah, I noticed one came up from that um, maybe Nancy was hoping that we could answer from Roy Silas here. Uh, he was asking Perfect. whether um, it would be good to redo an AST1 before moving on to AST2. And I'd say that's uh, not quite enough information to make a recommendation because it really depends on what you've been doing between your AST1 and and now. So if you kind of took that AST1 and hung up your skis and they've got cobwebs on them, and then you're thinking of going back into the backcountry three or four years later, I think it's probably worth redoing that AST1. But if you've been, you know, hard at it that whole time learning and expanding your knowledge and education and learning from mentors, uh, I think it'd be appropriate to move into an AST2. But I don't want to kind of give a general answer. I think it's important to get a really situation specific answer. And that would be an answer you'd get from an AST provider. So find out who's providing ASTs in your area. Talk with them about what you've done between now and your your last AST, and they can probably give you, or they can certainly give you advice about what course is right for you. Thank you very much, uh, there, Colin. Um, I was wondering if uh, Nancy was catching that in the chat box there. She caught a couple, or yeah, she caught that one. Yeah. And I don't yeah. see too much else showing up there. Yeah. And I think we're just getting a lot of kudos in the chat box right now. And uh, thanks to Colin and Sandra for an excellent evening. That was a great introduction for anyone who's new out there and a good refresher and reminders to uh, all of us folks that just keep going out on a regular basis, you know, to make sure we uh, dot the I's and cross the T's before we head out into the back country. Awesome turnout too. It's on our website, everybody. Um, avalanche.ca, your one-stop avalanche shop. It's got a ton of stuff on there, trip planners, forecasts, weather, you name it. If you're just getting into it, and even if you're not, the new Avi Savvy uh, tutorial on there is fantastic. It's uh, It always makes you question what you're doing out there. It just makes you think about it. And we super appreciate your guys' show of interest tonight. Um, you know, with that being said... For Avalanche Canada, we are a nonprofit organization. Um, your interest in avalanche safety, it's easily to support these essential programs like we're running tonight, our forecasts, stuff is long like that. Just simple donations, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, anything you got. Hey, we're going to drop a link in the chat box. You can go there and donate to Avalanche Canada. Hey, Brent, move but, those. Uh, if you can, the, the black boxes are blocking your slide. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. For <laughs> no worries. Are they gone now? uh yes awesome cool you know we try and practice so many things and uh we have so many windows open at a special time in our webinars and uh looks like i just got called out <laughs> so speaking of webinars we got this series going it's going to be running through the entire winter um our next webinar is next wednesday november 10th that's next week powder power and pitfalls leveraging social media and the mountain information network for a safer winter like we all spend time on our devices and sharing via social, you know, how do we make the use of these powerful platforms while avoiding the pitfalls that they may cause out there? You know, we're going to explore many considerations and questions with our South Rockies field tech, Jennifer Coulter. She's out there striving to make the men a fantastic thing and build a resilient avalanche community and improve public safety by using these social media tools properly. Pre-registration is required, folks. And uh, I'd just love to thank everyone for coming out, showing an interest in avalanche safety, and we hope you enjoy your winter backcountry and be safe from avalanches out there. And we hope you have a fantastic night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care.